We have a joint responsibility to the American people to hold this administration accountable, regardless of political affiliations. The services, uh, servicers we hear from today have worked to comply with 800 HAMP rules issued in over 15 different set of guidelines. Not surprisingly, they have been able to offer far more mortgage modifications privately outside of HAMP than within it. Ultimately, however, the best mortgage modification is a job. And unfortunately, this Congress and this administration has stifled private sector job creation through their big government anti-economic growth agenda. The implications of these policy mistakes are being felt by former home, uh, homeowners across this great country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his statement, but let me just indicate to you that we did have Treasury in, we did have GAO, and uh, we had SIGTARP, and of course, you know, you can't do but so much in one day. GAO right. study was out this, yeah. came out this morning, Mr. Chairman. That's right. what we need to hear about. Uh, gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm concerned about the claims. First of all, thank you for holding the hearing. And I'm concerned about the claims published in the uh, Washington Post this past Monday that a growing number of borrowers are failing to move from the HAMP program's initial stage into a permanent loan modification. More than 100,000 borrowers lost their mortgage aid in May. About half of those dropped from the federal program received another type of loan modification from their banks, according to the government data. But housing counselors have complained that those alternative loan modifications are typically not as generous as what the government <coughs> program offers and often come with uh, hefty upfront fees. I'm interested to, <coughs> to see how these options have been communicated with the borrowers. Getting started and understanding the process can be one of the toughest steps in the long loan modification efforts. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, for the, over the last 15 months, uh, I've held four foreclosure prevention workshops in my district, and I can tell you that the, the, the key is that we have to have effective and efficient programs. Uh, it's one thing to talk about them. It's another thing to actually carry them out, and uh, hopefully the people uh, who are testifying before us today uh, can help us get better insight as to how we can keep people in their homes. I've told my constituents that they must protect their house. House is their number one investment in most instances uh, and a very, very important investment. And I think that we need to be doing more and more to help people retain their homes so that they can have the stability and so that we can keep, uh, so they can keep their families stable and also, of course, so that we can keep neighborhoods stable. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize um, Mr. Turner. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Recognize. Could, could you Mr. clarify Chairman. for us how the how the time is? Are, are you saying that that there's five, Mr. Chairman? Are you saying that there's five minutes over there and there's five minutes yeah, over here? Yeah. Actually, yield, yeah, he yield back. So we we still have uh, three minutes left on this side. Okay. All right. So we now you have your okay. entire five minutes on this side. Well, and then I want to pass it to. Okay. Great. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, you, you said, um, as you know, you acknowledged the request um, by um, the ranking member for a representative from Treasury, and you said, you know, we can only do so much in one day. I can tell you that we'd come back. I mean, we're, we're a hardworking committee, and everybody would but be gentlemen, glad you to be for here. a second. We've had Treasury. You act as if we did not. You have haven't treasury, had them since Monday when they had their report issued that says that this program is failing, and and I've got some very serious questions. You know, just yesterday. Just yesterday, the Treasury Secretary appeared before the Congressional Oversight Panel where he was asked a question about HAMP, and do you know what he said? He said this program was not designed to prevent foreclosures. It was not designed to sustain home ownership at a level that would be unachievable, imprudent to try to do. He goes on to say, when someone asks him, well, what, you know, do you think it should go to 65 percent of home ownership level? He says, I think you're describing exactly the objectives that have shaped this program. The chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel responding to his comments said this, I was very surprised and very frustrated by the notion that the secretary seemed to be saying that a program that helps only a tiny handful of families facing foreclosures is a successful program because, in effect, the rest deserve to lose their homes. She says, I thought that was shocking. I find it shocking. 
I, I find it inconsistent with the chairman's opening statement about what this program is to, to do, and you know, certainly Secretary Geithner is responsible for uh, ensuring the success of the program. I also find it inconsistent with what the president told the American people this, this program was going to do. Now, now we, have, we have an absolute crisis, and it is not over. I mean, I'm, I'm from Montgomery County, Ohio, and the foreclosure rate is staggering in my community. Ohio has seen that the foreclosures continue to mount, and, and clearly this needs to be addressed not only by Treasury addressing this program and giving people real answers as to its goals and objectives, but also for the financial institutions, because we cannot lose focus here that the financial institutions got us in this mess. This is not a government-created mess by their lending practices that did not make sense, that were not sound business decisions, that did not protect the banks, and did not protect capital investments. And the concern that I have as I look to Treasury and then to the financial institutions is that decisions are being made currently that don't protect capital. Every member of Congress can tell you that the realtors in their communities tell them that it is virtually impossible to get lo loan servicers, banks, or financial institutions to work with a home buyer to get a short sale to do things that would avoid foreclosure. Now, this is what I don't understand, and I'm looking forward to some information to today. The test under the HAMP program is supposed to preserve capital for the banks, but apparently it's not a program that even the banks are, are with zeal um, pursuing. And then when you look at, at, at the market, any time that we can afford, that we can avoid foreclosure, you make more, you've preserved your capital, the market sustains more because when the home goes into foreclosure, prices in, in a neighborhood drop and families are sustained. So I'm interested today in why isn't this program working? Why isn't Treasury here? But also from you guys, why aren't you operating in what we would all believe a market standard of capital preservation because we are continuing to proceed toward foreclosure at rates where we all know people are approaching the financial institutions with deals and offers that are being rejected that would have a higher return than foreclosure does. I'm interested in, in, in some of those answers today. Let me yield back. I yield back. Yeah. I now recognize um, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me I'll, just say uh, you have three minutes. For one, I'm going to I'm going to take one minute if you let me know when that's done. Um, we know that the state of Ohio received another $172 million so that people could be counseling individuals on how to stay in their home. And I'm, I'm grateful for the administration of that. But we also know that servicers have been referring eligible borrowers to foreclosure until they've been evaluated for HAMP. Uh, Treasury had to intervene to try to put a stop to that practice. Uh, we know that Bank of America has uh, uh, 13 percent permanent modifications, J.P. Morgan Chase 20 percent, uh, Wells Fargo 22 percent, City Mortgage 23 percent, American Home Mortgage servicing 16 percent. This whole program is about keeping people in their homes and yet we're finding that uh, the servicers uh, apparently are not uh, stepping up in a way that uh, can encourage more and more people to stay in. We know that uh, people are not given reasons, uh, uh, understandable reasons, why their uh, home affordable mortgage uh, modification program is denied. Uh, that it's sketchy as to what, how people appeal a denial. Uh, that, uh, and to have their denials reviewed before they face foreclosure. I mean, these are all things that this hearing is going to get into. Uh, but, you know, we're glad you're doing what you're doing, but it's not enough. Gentlemen's um, one minute is up. Thank you. Yeah. Gentleman from um, Virginia, we ha he has two minutes left. I thank the chairman. Uh, I just want to say I, I appreciate uh, the uh, steadfastness of our friends on the other side of the aisle and wanted to look at a program and make sure it's better uh, and, uh, and working. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle are the same ones that stood by and uh, allowed for no or loose regulation that created the subprime mortgage bubble in the first place. And to a person, they opposed helping anybody who was underwater or threaten threatened with foreclosure, including in Ohio. Um, uh, not one person in America would have been helped if their vote had actually been the majority vote when we looked at the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. 
So when we're looking at the subject and we're looking at well, imperfect well, models yield. that are not well, succeeding, well, I will yield. not yield. Well, uh, that are yield. not, I will not yield. I, that are not succeeding to the fullest extent. Let's remember that there are some among us who would have helped not at all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, North Carolina has, what, two minutes? How much? One minute. The gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, say to the Chairman that uh, my colleague on the left uh, is, is flat wrong. What he's saying is actually not the case. We want a workable program that will actually help homeowners, not a failed program that is expensive to the taxpayers and doesn't actually help home homeowners. It's been an absolute failure. GAO reports report after report. If we talk to folks in our communities and our districts, they'll tell you it's not working. And I've been, I've been front and center on this issue trying to help homeowners at home and here in Washington with policies. And it was the party over there that would do nothing about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which really added fuel to the fire of subprime and this mortgage crisis that we're inheriting and that we're trying to work through right now. So rather than this guy blaming Bush, Let's move forward. Let's try to do something reasonable for homeowners. They're sick and tired of this kind of petty politics. We want to fix this problem, not simply throw some money at it. We want a workable solution, uh, not some empty rhetoric. Okay. And so with that, um, be happy to yield back or yeah, yield to my colleague. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. But let me just say to all of the members of the committee, there's enough blame to go around. I mean, I want you to know that that's... Um, uh, and we've just sort of put things in the proper context. We've had the Treasury Department, GAO, and the SIGTARP to testify at our first hearing on this issue. Treasury was questioned by the committee for more than three hours on the performance of HAMP at the first hearing. And now it's the bank's turn, and we are going to hear from them today. But more importantly, let me state, HAMP is not the only way to address the foreclosure problem. HAMP is just a part of the solution, but not the whole solution. Uh, we need the wholehearted cooperation of everybody across the board, even this committee. On that note, I see no recognition. We had a minute left on that side. So, uh, we, yes, uh, one minute from Cong the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the American homeowners who are grieving right now and pleading for some kind of modification don't care if it's HAMP or something organized by the bank. They just want some relief. And I think it's shameful that um, my colleagues feel compelled to point fingers one way or the other. The one issue that is really critical that we have to look at is the conflict of interest that exists where there is a mortgage and a second mortgage and the servicer has an interest in the second mortgage and therefore will not negotiate uh, a, a modification with the first mortgage. That's a really serious issue and one that we should address here today. I yield back. All time has now expired. Um, we return to our panel of witnesses. Uh, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. If you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Yes. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Doss is the Chief Executive Officer of City Mortgage. We inform customers about these options as part of the HAMP decline process. For customers who have not met the requirements of the trial period, they receive letters that clearly state the reason for ineligibility. More than 40 percent of the declines we've mailed are because of missed payments in the trial period. Bank of America provides a dedicated toll-free number for customers to appeal the decision, provide updated financial information, or discuss other options. We will not complete a foreclosure sale until the appeal period has expired. Innovative solutions have, helped create, have been created to help customers sustain home ownership, and Bank of America is committed to executing those programs well. 
All of us at Bank of America, including the thousands of associates who work on these ef issues every day, take seriously our role in helping customers through this difficult cycle. Thank you, and I'll be pleased to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Friedman. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Isa, and members of the committee, we at American Home appreciate the committee's consideration of the complex issues surrounding the efforts of servicers to implement HAMP. American Home Mortgage Servicing, or AMSA, is a non-prime residential loan servicer that does not own, originate, nor have any interest in any of the loans that we service. Our focus is on keeping borrowers in their homes while balancing our obligation to provide continued cash flows to investors. Contrary to popular opinion, servicers do not make money on foreclosures. They benefit no one and undertaken only as a last resort when other foreclosure solutions are not available. We aggressively pursue any reasonable modification opportunity in the best interest of the investor through early intervention. All troubled loans are routinely reviewed for HAMP or other loss mitigation workout consideration. Although we already have made thorough solicitation efforts of our portfolio, we are again in the process of resoliciting every borrower potential for, that has potential for HAMP eligibility. To assist borrowers in avoiding foreclosure, we have, among other things, established a dedicated team of housing counselors and trained our call center associates as to loss mitigation opportunities. We have invested in the development of improved proprietary information systems, built relationships with housing agencies, counseling agencies, and housing alliances, participated extensively in outreach events, considered borrowers for proprietary modifications in, in situations <clears throat> where we are unable to offer a HAMP modification, and we have offered other foreclosure alternative solutions whenever a modification is not appropriate. Several barriers remain despite significant progress by the industry in the implementation of HAMP. Even with relaxed standards, the required underwriting documents are too burdensome. Many borrowers are unable to provide these documents or simply choose not to do so. Servicers such as OMSI who experience redefault rates that are significantly less than industry averages should be allowed to rely upon the proven, less stringent underwriting requirements. Many borrowers delay in responding to standard HAMP solicitations, and others are confused by program enhancements that are prematurely announced. Frequent program changes have overtaxed servicer systems and processes, and the newly announced HAMP principal reduction program has increased the number of so-called strategic defaulters, otherwise able borrowers who purposely stop paying on their mortgages to seek HAMP assistance. By failing to emphasize the necessity of a valid hardship, HAMP does not discourage this type of behavior. The HAMP program has experienced significant issues in converting trial period plans to permanent <laughs> modifications. Many borrowers failed to make the required trial payments and now are permanently ineligible for HAMP. Many others failed to timely return executed modification agreements despite our extensive efforts to collect those documents. Deficiencies in and complexities of the HAMP reporting system, IR2, have made it difficult to officially report many permanent modifications. Not all borrowers qualify for a HAMP modification. <clears throat> the top three factors for denials are the property is not the borrower's primary residence, the applicable securitization servicing documents restrict or prohibit modifications, and the borrower failed to provide a complete underwriting package. OMSI has established an appeal process for HAMP denials, and an independent team reviews and confirms denials. Borrowers that do not qualify for a HAMP mod are reviewed to determine if other proprietary home retention options will prevent foreclosure. We maintain a robust complaint tracking and resolution process that is dedicated to handling all borrower complaints. We take our responsibilities under the HAMP program seriously. We've been audited by MHA compliance twice. Each time there were no major findings 
or enforcement actions. HAMP compliance often imposes unnecessarily complex burdens on servicers that divert resources away from more productive customer-facing activities. While performance is improving, challenges persist even as the program matures. In conclusion, OMSI is firmly committed to HAMP and to its goals and standards. We are anxious to see the program succeed and look forward to working with the Treasury and Congress to implement any needed improvements. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Friedman. Mr. Hyatt. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, I'm Mike Hyde, co-president of Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. Thank you for the opportunity to share the results Wells Fargo has achieved in assisting homeowners across America. Because of the product choices we've made, our disciplined underwriting, and the manner in which we approach foreclosure prevention, our delinquency and foreclosure rates in the first quarter of 2010 were three-fourths the industry average, and on an annual basis, less than 2% of our owner-occupied servicing portfolio has gone to foreclosure sale. To begin with just a few examples of the actions we have undertaken to achieve these results, since January 2009 through May of 2010, we have helped more than 2.2 million homeowners with new low-rate loans, either to purchase a home or refinance their existing mortgage. We have assisted about a half million loan customers with trial or completed modifications, about one-fifth of which are through the HAMP program. We have assisted more than 100,000 unemployed customers with short-term modifications. Starting in January of 2009, several months before the creation of HAMP, we led the industry by permanently forgiving more than $3 billion in principal for more than 55,000 customers, which amounts to more than $50,000 per loan. We have begun offering home payment relief to customers affected by the oil spill in the Gulf Coast. With respect to our loan modification efforts, while very difficult to achieve, we believe we must continue to balance the needs and interests of homeowners in financial distress with those who have remained diligent in making their mortgage payments. While much focus deservedly is directed to those consumers behind on their payments, we cannot lose sight of the fact that about 92 percent of Wells Fargo's mortgage customers are current in their home payments as of the first quarter of 2010. HAMP is a good option for people who meet certain criteria, but it's only part of the home retention story. By the Treasury Department's own April 2010 estimates for Wells Fargo, only three of every ten customers, 60 or more days past due on their home payments, are potential candidates for HAMP. As a result, servicers and investors have additional programs for the vast number of customers who are not eligible or likely will not qualify for HAMP. Taking all of these programs into account, about two-thirds of Wells Fargo's customers more than 60 days behind on their home payments are provided an option to prevent foreclosure. Finally, with the benefit of hindsight, it is clear the industry was not prepared for the significant number of customers that would face financial hardships as the economy continued to become more challenging. Wells Fargo is not always consistent in providing the level of service we expect to deliver our customers. But over the past year, we have committed tremendous resources and believe we have come a long way in providing and improving our service. For example, we have hired more than 10,000 people for a total of 17,800 U.S.-based home preservation jobs. By the end of this month, we will complete the process of assigning one person to manage one loan modification from beginning to end. In other words, our customers will know exactly who they are working with from start to finish. We continue our work with other industry participants to accelerate the credit decision process, setting a five-day decision target once all documents are in hand, as compared to the HAMP standard of 30 days. We have invested in improvements in workflow systems and document imaging. We have participated in more than 300 home preservation events, including 10 large-scale events solely for our customers, and established 27 home preservation centers in six states where we have concentrations of at-risk customers. We now give Wells Fargo Home Mortgage Loan customers a short sale decision in 5 to 15 days, and we continue to have a dedicated phone line for your staff to use in the event one of your constituents, our customer, has an issue that needs resolution. In conclusion, Wells Fargo will continue to lead the industry in further improving methods and programs to assist homeowners. We believe very strongly and feel very deeply about our responsibility to help homeowners in a balanced and fair way. And we believe our actions demonstrate our commitment to achieving this goal. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Lohman. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. 
My name is Dave Lohman, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Home Lending at J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase shares your commitment to helping homeowners and stabilizing our nation's housing market. At Chase, we are working hard to help families meet their mortgage obligations and keep them in their homes by making their payments affordable. To date, we have helped prevent hundreds of thousands of foreclosures through our own proprietary modification programs, HAMP, and other agency programs. In addition, we have refinanced nearly $21 billion of loans under HARP. HAMP modification performance has been strong. At Chase, we are now completing more than 10,000 permanent modifications per month. On average, homeowners are seeing their monthly payments reduced by more than $530, an average payment reduction of 28 percent. We are also adopting and implementing the federal government's foreclosure alternative program and second lien modification program to help more borrowers. We actively use temporary forbearance agreements for unemployed borrowers, similar to the program recently announced by the administration. You have asked us to focus our testimony on how we can make foreclosure prevention initiatives, including HAMP, more effective for borrowers. From the beginning of 2009 through the end of May 2010, Chase offered almost 850,000 modifications to struggling homeowners and made 172,000 of these modifications permanent under HAMP and other programs. HAMP is one of the tools we use to help these borrowers. Chase has offered HAMP trials to nearly 260,000 borrowers. Of these, 88,000 are in active HAMP trials and 48,000 have converted to permanent modifications. Our experience has demonstrated that HAMP loans with a meaningful reduction in monthly payment perform very well. In particular, once borrowers have successfully completed the three-month three trial period, the loans redefault less frequently than we or Treasury predicted, even where the loan was previously delinquent or has a high loan-to-value ratio. We conduct extensive outreach and have made significant investments in people, technology, and infrastructure. In response to our customers' needs, we have developed more creative approaches to reach borrowers in ways that work for them. We've opened 51 Chase Home Ownership Centers in 15 states and the District of Columbia, where 88,000 borrowers have met face-to-face -face with our trained counselors. On top of these efforts, we have also launched a national outreach tour of the nine cities where our customers need the most help. Events on the tour last four to five days and are staffed over the weekend, 12 hours a day, where we can help borrowers find solutions to the full range of challenges they face with their mortgages. The customer response to these events has been very positive. In total, nearly half of our entire staff in Chase are dedicated to helping homeowners. 7,600 of them are loan counselors who deal only with loan modifications for borrowers in financial difficulty. There are several challenges in implementing HAMP. The biggest challenge is that HAMP was designed to help a specific population of borrowers. As illustrated in the Department of Treasury's recent report, only one-third of borrowers who are 60 days or more past due are expected to be eligible for HAMP. Now that income and other documentation are required upfront and we are no longer relying, relying on stated income, we expect that the conversion rate from trial to permanent mod to increase substantially. Going forward, failure to make the required payment should be the primary reason that someone does not convert from a trial plan to a permanent modification. Another challenge has been HAMP's continuing evolution. There are good reasons for the number of changes, but nonetheless, we've had to adjust our systems and retrain our people as the program evolves. The evolution of the program has expanded the opportunities to keep people in their homes. We do not want to miss an opportunity to help a borrower stay in their home, so we individually review each case and will extend the trial period where needed in cases where we think the borrower is likely to qualify for a permanent modification. It's also important to note that where borrowers are making their payments in HAMP trial modifications but may, ultimately, may not ultimately qualify for a permanent HAMP modification, we believe we are able to qualify those borrowers for other modification programs. Now let me touch on fair lending. Similar to our loan origination business, Chase is committed to full compliance with the letter and spirit of all fair lending laws and seeks to make available foreclosure prevention solutions to all borrowers regardless of race, national origin, religion, age, gender, or any other prohibited bias. We are pleased to have this opportunity to share our progress with you. We look forward to continuing to work with members of Congress, the administration, our banking regulators, and our community leaders in implementing these initiatives to help families and to stabilize neighborhoods and the U.S. economy.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lohman. Um, Mr. Pinto. Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. In discussing HAMP, it's useful to recall its original goals. That, those were to help as many as three to four million financially struggling homeowners avoid foreclosure by modifying loans to a level that is affordable for borrowers now and sustainable over the long term. Second, to provide clear and consistent loan modification guidelines. Third, to determine a borrower's up eligibility up front. Last February, I testified before the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of this committee and advised that rather than avoiding three to four million foreclosures, HAMP at that juncture would likely help just 250,000 homeowners stay in their homes without default. As I will explain, it appears that my estimate from February was pretty close to the mark. The success rate is so low due to government initiatives mandating looser underwriting standards dating back to the early 1990s. It is this legacy of government mandates for weak loans that makes it so difficult to achieve successful modifications. A high default rate also works to keep HAMP's total successful modifications low. I expect a 40 percent, that 40 percent of permanent modifications will redefault. Treasury promised clear and consistent loan modification guidelines. There are only two words to describe HAMP's guidelines, numbing complexity. At last count, HAMP had 800 requirements and services are expected to certify compliance. Treasury also promised that a borrower's eligibility would be determined up front. As was recently observed in the Wall Street Journal, quote, eager for results, the Obama administration last year prodded banks to start people on trials without first obtaining documents proving they were eligible. <clears throat> that has led to many crushed hopes, close quote. Instead of a quick yes or no, homeowners were placed in trial modification limbo. Back in February, I indicated that HAMP's January pipeline would likely yield only 250,000 homeowners who would ulti ultimately avoid foreclosure under HAMP, only about 6 to 8 percent of the announced goal. HAMP activity has slowed markedly in the last few months with the number of new trial modifications declining by two-thirds between December 2009 and May 2010. The number of new permanent modifications last month was 30 percent below April's. As of May 31, 2010, there were 340,000 active permanent modifications. Assuming a 40 percent default rate, only 200,000 of these permanent modifications will likely be successful over the short term, excuse me, over the long term. There are another 468,000 active trial modifications. Of these, perhaps only 75,000 will become successful long-term permanent modifications. Discounting all the spin, the current HAMP pipeline will yield about 275,000 successful long-term permanent modifications, with perhaps another 100,000 uh, successes resulting from future trial modifications. Treasury's many missteps with HAMP has had other repercussions. It encouraged strategic defaults. Homeowners who are willing to default when the value of the mortgage exceeds the value of their home, even if they can afford to pay off their mortgage. Researchers at the University of Chicago and Northwestern University found that the percentage of foreclosures that were perceived to be strategic was 31 percent in March 2010, and that's up dramatically from the 22 percent in March 2009 when HAMP started. With more and more borrowers believing that lenders are failing to pursue those who default on their mortgages, there is a risk that a growing number of borrowers will walk away from their homes even if they can afford the monthly payment. HAMP has slowed down the foreclosure process, pushing the period of heightened foreclosure activity out to 2013 or 2014, and likely extending the time until the market corrects. But perhaps HAMP's greatest shortcoming is that it derailed burgeoning efforts of the private sector to effectively modify loans. The, fact or, the facts are in the Office of uh, Control of the Currency Mortgage Metrics Report uh, that's produced quarterly. Uh, there are three charts. Chart one demonstrates that the private sector uh, had been rapidly ramping up its modification efforts in 2008 and 2009, and it was when HAMP started that uh, those efforts were derailed. Uh, chart two indicates that the uh, private sector was having greater and greater success with the uh, re uh, reducing the redefault rate on loans that were being done outside the HAMP program. And chart three 
demonstrates the slowdown and effective wind down of the HAMP program as new trial uh, modifications have uh, fallen off precipitously and now the number of permanent mods has also started dropping. The committee should ask the Treasury Department where are the modifications that, but for HAMP, the private sector was on track to produce. This committee and the pe American people deserve an honest assessment as to HAMP's future. Thank you and I'd be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking all of you um, for your uh, testimony. Um, I guess the question is, you know, why haven't there been more permanent mortgage modifications? I mean, what is the problem? I mean, uh, and just quickly right down the line, uh, start with you, Mr. Dodds. Why do you sure. think that uh, there haven't been more? Is it lack of money? What's the problem? Uh, Chairman Towns, as, as we all collectively mentioned, uh, we've put an enormous amount of resources to make sure that we open this up to as many trial modifications as possible based on uh, stated income as opposed to verified income. So we really opened the door to as many people as we could. Um, we, so how uh, long should it take for the trial modification? I'm sorry? How long should that take? If you put well, a uh, trial uh, modification, how long should it take? It takes city about four months, which happens to be amongst the, the, the fastest in the industry. But um, uh, I don't believe uh, we have three trial payments, and then that converts to a modification, a permanent modification after that. But to answer your question, uh, Chairman, I believe that the reason the permanent mods are, are not as high as we would expect them to be is because in many cases uh, the um, documents that actually come in don't match with um, what was stated at the time of uh, the trial modification, and many borrowers were not able to make the trial payments. Uh, those have been, I would say, the two principal reasons for the fallout. Right. Mr. Sewer? Uh, under the HAMP program, the primary reason are 40 percent of the uh, borrowers who have been in a trial modification have failed to make a payment. And I think that's reflective of the ongoing stress of uh, the economy on those borrowers. And uh, I think it is important to look at the number of permanent modifications holistically. Uh, and when you look at our number, HAMP is a small number of a much larger, larger total of the 630,000 modifications. Understand that it's one of many tools that we use for borrowers. Yeah. Mr. Freeman. Same question to you. Um, in our particular situation, uh, we service a lot of loans that just don't qualify under the HAMP guidelines, um, such as uh, a conforming loan or non-conforming loans. We may have certain restrictions under uh, service or guidelines, but the vast majority of the real issue is really that we are so limited under this 31% debt to income test and the fact that in our particular book of business the borrower must occupy the property as their principal place of residence so um and then also the the documentation issue you know we initially up front had done always verification and requested documents up front so once we've got a borrower into a plan we have a very high conversion rate but again, it's a lot of this is on the borrower side as well, or the the complexities of the uh, uh, program itself. What I'd like to add is I think context is important here. Um, when you think about the half a million mods Wells Fargo has done, about 80 percent of those are outside of the HAMP program, and the vast majority of those are permanent mods already or are on their way to becoming permanent mods. Inside the HAMP program, inside the 20 percent, the primary factors in terms of converting from uh, to trial to permanent are the same Treasury quoted in their report. Lack of documentation because of the stated income programs of last summer, that has since changed. Um, once documents are received, customers are not eligible for the program and therefore go through a cancellation phase and get, you typically get a modification outside of the HAMP program. And then finally, customers that just don't make the three trial payments within the HAMP program itself are the three primary HAMP factors, but I, I would encourage you to continue to keep focus on the fact that the vast majority of mods getting done are happening uh, outside the HAMP program itself. Mr. Loman, real quick. Uh, just echoing the same thing that, that my uh, compatriots here have, have spoken about, uh, mispayments and uh, 
no documents returned from borrowers are the major reasons why uh, modifications don't get completed. Uh, about a third of those that um, that do do give us documents uh, and and do in fact uh, um, make the payments. Uh, a third of the total population ultimately end up in a mod. When you say no, you don't get the documents, I mean, uh, is it a lack of communication? You know, because a person. Well, we we've made extensive uh, refinements in our process, uh, including uh, communicating with borrowers and you know writing them letters and knocking on doors and what have you. That that process obviously has evolved over time. Um, I would say at the beginning of the program that may have been the case, but I would say now we're equipped to adequately, you know, communicate with borrowers. Is communication a problem? I mean, for just very quickly, yay, nay, uh, could you sort of tell me? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the issue is <clears throat> actually, um, as you sort of analyze the, uh, the contact rates, uh, it seems to us that at, late, at a late stage of delinquency, a lot of customers have a very low contact rate, primarily because they may have checked out from the process. Uh, so uh, this needs early interventions really critical. Yeah. No, is, anything we, we, is there anything that we need to do? Because, you know, people are losing their homes, and I just can't see if a person is losing his or her house that they're not going to cooperate in terms of documentation. You know, because, I mean, they're asking for help, and that's the part I don't quite understand. Maybe a couple of examples might help. I think there's uh, a lot going on when a customer is in fear of losing their home, and we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure that doesn't happen. A couple of the documents that are troublesome is the, the HAMP program does require a tax return. I think you know, that conjures up fears that will let trigger an IRS audit. Those kinds of things are very real in people's minds. The HAMP uh, uh, modification agreement itself is a very intimidating looking piece of paper. It's a five pages, single spaced, uh, very intimidating, very scary kind of process that I think people are reluctant or fearful. Uh, to carry, you know, what else might happen here. So I don't think it's the communication between servicer and homeowner that's at issue here. I don't think there's additional things that you should do, you should and can do. I think this is really now a matter of working very dil diligently and very hard with every single customer to make sure that foreclosure does not happen. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, HAMP, I think, has not only failed to help people, it's, it's, it's actually harmed families, uh, I think, in two ways. One is the, the comments uh, that the, the Wall Street Journal had, and I, I related to my opening statement, the false hope it gave people who were in the temporary or trial modification program who never qualified in the financial implications of going through that process or part of that, part of that process. Also think, secondly, the point Mr. Pinto raised. I think his, his quote was, it derailed private sector efforts to help. Uh, so I think in two ways it's been not just a failure to help, but also potentially caused harm to the very families we're, who, were, who were trying to get the help and who were trying to, to uh, provide help, uh, help to. Um, the numbers you all gave, I have 900,000 for Citi, 600,000 for, for Bank of America, 135,000 for home mortgage servicing, 500,000 for Wells Fargo, and 846,000 for J.P. Morgan. Of, of those numbers, I'm going to go down the list, 900,000 uh, modifications you've made, what, what number uh, of those are HAMP modifications? I, I took that as being the, all the, the big yes. number. Okay. Uh, since 2007, we've helped 900,000 homeowners. Right. Uh, what, what, uh, what percentage have been HAMP, or what's the number for HAMP? Well, recently we offered uh, HAMP trials to 150,000 uh, customers, and out of that, about 30-odd thousand have taken HAMP. 38? So, 30,000. 30, 35,000. Small percentage. Yes. Uh, 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 we go to Bank of America. 630,000 permanent modifications since 2008. 70,000 of them are HAMP. Uh, we have reported out about 8,800, and we have about 16,000 um, yeah, 16, currently in trial periods. But And, and permanent? For permanent. Uh, the the Eight. 88 is reported okay. out as permanent. 8,000 8, out of 135,000 modifications, 8, only 8,000 in HAMP. Wells Fargo? We've got 500,000 mods, uh, trials, and permanents. 20 percent of them are inside of HAMP. And uh, inside of HAMP, there's probably 45,000 in trial yet, probably 40, 45,000 or so in permanent. So a total so less of less than 10 percent. 10 percent is kind of in the no. Go ahead. 257,000 in HAMP of our 846,000. How, how many are permanent? Uh, permanent, 47,000. 
So again, very small number. We're talking uh, less than less than 10 percent. Here's the question. I think we just cut to the chase. The people who qualified for HAMP went through this cumbersome process, 800 different rules, 15 sets of guidelines, all this stuff they had to go through. Mr. Uh, Hyde just described what the intimidating process they had to go through. Of the folks in the HAMP, the 47,000, the small number that you, how many of those are, let's ask it this way. The people who qualified for HAMP, would any of those not qualified for your own modification program? Uh, let's put it this way. For the people that fell out of HAMP, we were able to save about 15 percent more. So the ones who HAMP. wouldn't qualify for HAMP, you were able to help? Yes. And it's working? And it's working. All right. I uh, can't tell an exact number, but the potential does exist because of the Treasury incentives that it enabled it to make more sense for the investor to be a HAMP modification. But I think m many the of them is, would those have qualified. Many? Many, but I, I don't know the exact number. Mr. Friedman. Uh, about two-thirds would qualify for a proprietary mod. Two-thirds of the permanent two, two I mean, wh wh what's the number? Well, the question, I believe, was of the HAMP participants, how many would have qualified under a proprietary modification program, and about two-thirds of those would have. Let me ask it more specifically. Of those in HAMP who, who, who got into permanent status in HAMP, uh, would any of those not got into permanent status with, with one of your programs? Yeah, only, only those will be limited by certain investor concerns that under our pooling and servicing agreements. So it would be a small amount. I think a time stamp on this is important. If the issue is right now, mm -hmm. I think right now with all the programs available, the majority of customers that get a HAMP would probably get a non-HAMP. I don't have an exact number. To the other point about customers that are canceling out of HAMP, uh, Treasury provided some statistics on that earlier in the week. In Wells Fargo's case, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the HAMP cancellations are resulting in some other form of saving the home or avoiding foreclosure. Mr. Lawman. Most would qualify for the proprietary program. So, so I mean, here we are. We got a program where it was promised 75 billion, three to four million uh, folks it was going to help. It's helped 346,000 to date and get into permanent. And yet, the vast majority of those who made it into the permanent qualification would have made it in one of your own modification programs without putting taxpayer money, without this, this big government hassle and mess. And then those who got kicked out were also finding out the majority of them you could have helped. Mr. Pinto, I know you want to weigh in on this. We've got I, 30 seconds. I just seconds. add so one ahead. fact. Uh, about 60 percent of all HAMP mods are Fannie Freddie. So this issue, uh, you know, yes, there are some investors outside of that, but Fannie and Freddie is, is, is the majority of it. <clears throat> so that's, uh, and, and of course, uh, they don't need to be paid an incentive to, to do uh, what they need to do. Great point, Mr. Chairman. I think this points out, well, I think, it's, Simon, I think it's obvious what it points out. I gentleman's guess. time has expired. The, um, let me just go to uh, Ms. Spear when she was here. She said something that I agree with. Um, you know, I, I, HAMP is fine, but my, my uh, constituents uh, want to have some kind of relief. And so whatever it takes to accomplish that, that's what we're trying to do. In my district, we, um, we hold what we call foreclosure prevention conferences. We've done 15 of them, so five of them, four of them so far. We just did one uh, about a week ago. And as I listen to your testimony, I understand better now uh, why we're able to save at least two-thirds of people's houses. And a lot of it goes to when you talk about documents, um, what I find, what we found in our office is that a lot of times it is an intimidating process uh, with regard to these applications. And we have two people on our staff, and basically what they do almost full time uh, is help people with foreclosure because it is a difficult, it is not the easiest of processes. So I want to go to you all and just ask the question. You, you say that one of the reasons why you can't, it's so difficult that people stay in, in the temporary phase is because um, they're not getting the proper documents in and they're not turning in uh, the way they're supposed to. Well, what we have found is that, be it HAMP or anything else, that a lot of times the mortgage companies are understaffed. I mean, I, and I, I can tell you that for a fact. Now, it's gotten better. And so when people would call in, they couldn't, first of all, they couldn't get anybody on the phone. 
Then if they got somebody on the phone, they uh, got the runaround. And then if they got somebody and was able to avoid the runaround, then the paperwork got all m mixed up. And I've seen instances where uh, paperwork has been sent to folks, uh, to, went to the mortgage company four or five times, and then the mortgage companies and some the same companies are sitting here now have said to my people, and I know this for a fact, that they never got it. And we've actually sent paperwork from our office. So um, I want to know what you all have done with regard to staffing. That is, putting in training staff is one thing to have staff. It's another thing to have a staff that is properly trained. And, um, and what have you done with regard, we see, it seems like you're saying that in order for people to move from a temporary to a permanent, it seems like paperwork is one of the main things that's holding them up. And I heard, I think it, you, Ms. Dershier, say that, you know, some of these people are not making payments uh, during the temporary stage. I think, was it you that said 40 percent? See, we don't find that to be the case. We find people that want to make the payments. And we've, we've actually found people, a lot of people who made payments, and then the mortgage company told them they didn't make payments. And we've got, we literally, my staff would have the copy of the check or the money, the money order in their hand. So, you know, there's a disconnect here. So the question is, I'll start with you, Mr. Hyde, since I'm kind of familiar with Wells Fargo. Why don't you tell us what you all are doing with regard to that staffing? And have you found that to be something of significance when you, and if you did staff up, how did it affect the operation and your results? Sure. I, I think your criticism is very fair a year ago. We were not where we should have been a year ago. We've made a lot of progress in the course of the last year. We've attended your events. We've created our own events as ways to gather the documents. And I think most importantly, what we have implemented and by the end of the month will be done is our one-to-one -one approach where every single customer will know exactly who they're working with and everybody on our side knows exactly which customers they're accountable for in a one-to-one -one way. In order to get there, we've added more than 10,000 people over the course of the last year. It's kind of expensive, huh? I'm sorry? Kind of expensive. Absolutely. Would you all rather see somebody stay in a house than, than be foreclosed upon? Absolutely. And, and why is that? I mean, foreclosure is the absolute last resort. And I mean, a lot of reasons. I mean, one, it's the right thing to do. Uh, beyond the right thing to do, economically, it's always in the investor's interest, our shareholder's interest, the community interest, customer interest, to do everything you possibly can to keep the customer in the home or find an alternative to foreclosure. Uh, I think every one of us sitting at the table would completely say to you, foreclosure is absolutely the last resort. Mr. Towns and I, Chairman Towns and I, sit on the conference committee for Wall Street reform, and we had an amend. There was a, 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 a an amendment yesterday to make sure that there was a, a temporary a fund, a resolving loan fund for $3 billion to help people who may have lost their jobs. Every single Republican voted against it, every single one of them. And I heard some of them say a little bit earlier that they were concerned that not enough wasn't done, being done by Congress. Fortunately, it passed on the House side in the conference. But, uh, but I see my time is up, and perhaps uh, I can get some answers to whether you all believe such a thing is very important later. Uh, Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I thank you for all being here, and thank you for being um, so helpful in, in, uh, in your answers, because as you know, we're, we're all struggling and trying to figure this out. <clears throat> and as we're trying to figure it out, uh, you have specific expertise, not just in your view of the government program, but in the issue of you know, what's happening in the market, what's happening with homeowners, and, and what needs to be done. So I appreciate that you've been so forthcoming. Um, as I said in my opening, you know, Treasury Secretary Geithner yesterday, um, w when uh, appearing before the Congressional Oversight Panel, uh, said about HAMP, this program was not designed to prevent foreclosures. It was not designed to sustain homeownership at a level that would be unacceptable, imprudent to try and do. He was then asked about the homeownership rate level. What, what would it be? What would be a um, a markedly uh, market efficient number. Um, someone offered 65 percent, and he tended to agree that that was an objective. Reuters responds. Um, <coughs> Reuters relates his statement as Geithner said he agreed with the assessment that housing will only stabilize as more homeowners become renters again. Do you guys agree with that? 
Do you agree with our Treasury Secretary that the market will only stabilize as more homeowners become renters? Because that seems contrary to what our whole, whole goal was here in trying to stabilize homeowners in their home. Mr. Stoss, we'll start with you. Congressman, uh, I'm not qualified to answer the Treasury Secretary's response, but I will say that um, um, when, we f when we focused on hemp as an industry, we wanted to create a great uniform baseline across the country. There was no baseline modification. There were all kinds of proprietary programs. So in the last year, hemp has done, we've done a great deal with respect to hemp to get to a uniform baseline. However, there will be fallouts and there will be redefaults. And I believe that the issue needs to move, the focus needs to move beyond modifications to foreclosure prevention. Um, and I believe that short sales and deed in lieu is, are the programs that we, sh we should really focus on. And I believe that that's where the right. discussion Ms. should Ms. Doster, be. do you believe more people need to be renters? The HAMP program and other modification programs are primarily built to m ensure that the payment is affordable. And what HAMP has done is set a new standard for the industry at that 31 percent debt to income ratio of the Mortgage Taxes Insurance Homeowners Association to income. And in that spirit, there are a large number of, of, of people who would not qualify. And I agree that at some point, if they can't afford to sustain uh, a, a mortgage payment at a level commensurate with their income, then they do need to move on to alternative kinds of housing. And that's what short sales and deed in lieu and other programs uh, are, are attempting. Uh, and we're working hard to ensure that there's a dignified transition as an alternative the, the, to the, foreclosure. The point that the Treasury Secretary made, which is why I'm asking the question, and, and I disagree with the Treasury Secretary, is it, it's not that he's talking about the individual decision of a homeowner as a borrower who finds themselves in an untenable debt position and then must make the choice of, of leaving the home, surrendering it, going through then the process of becoming a renter. He's actually saying that for housing prices to stabilize, that he personally believes that more homeowners should become renters, according to Reuters. And that seems contrary to this program. And, and of course, he characterizes it here as this program was not designed to prevent foreclosures, which I, I could have sworn that that's what President Obama said it was supposed to do. Um, Mr. Friedman, what do you think about more people becoming renters? Well, <clears throat> again, you know, I wasn't uh, around the secretary when he made the comment, but I mean, I do believe it is a fact that, you know, not all homeowners can afford their mortgage payment. And as a result, you know, like many of us, if you, you know, spend too much money on something, you have to uh, cut something else out. And I think, you know, um, that could very well be what he meant. I think as a general policy, you know, I think home ownership is a great thing if people don't get greedy and they can then, you know, can pay their mortgage and, and can afford all those things that go along with home ownership. Well, one other thing I want to add, because my time is expiring, is that in listening to all of your testimonies about how you have been approaching homeowners, I can tell you that the anecdotal stories that we hear from uh, realtors, from nonprofits that are trying to assist homeowners, is that the loan servicers are not responsive. That, in fact, it is an incredibly difficult process, even when you have a, um, a social worker that is sitting guiding someone through the process. That, in, in fact, you are making decisions that don't follow the market. That when there are short sales that are offered, that in fact you allow the loans to go to foreclosure. And I want to say, Mr. Chairman, I think one thing that would be really helpful is to have not a panel uh, of loan servicers, but have loan servicers on one side of the room and have realtors and nonprofits that are helping people on one side of the room. And let these two people go at it, because we're hearing a different story than you're telling us today. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the gentleman at the, uh, and the uh, gentlelady at the table, uh, each of you represents lenders or agents of lenders who would not exist in their current form, but for the beneficence of the United States taxpayer. And I remind each of you that out, without the continued support of the American taxpayer, there would be virtually zero residential housing market activity. The issue before us today is why in the world aren't you giving loan modifications to more eligible borrowers? Why are you denying loan modifications to my constituents in spite of the fact that we have a federal program which pays you, the mortgage holders, an incentive to modify the terms of the mortgages and compensates you for many of your costs? I'd, I'd like to uh, hear some justification. Mr. Lohman, you want to respond? 
Yeah, um, we're helping all the people that, um, that come to us and that we contact. Um, we have made extensive investments in people, uh, systems, um, you know, infrastructure. Um, the folks uh, that don't get a modification, uh, it's generally for two reasons. Either um, they failed to pay us during the trial period uh, or they don't qualify for the for their programs. Um, maybe their income isn't isn't enough to afford a home. Um, or they don't provide the required documents. Okay, um, well, let me, let me just share this with you. At the end of May, my state of Ohio had 136,910 seriously delinquent loans, and only 12.95% of those loans have been modified. So here's Ohio's 42nd out of 51, including the District of Columbia, in the ratio of HAMP modifications to seriously delinquent loans. Now, in early May, I held an open meeting in my district with uh, Treasury Assistant Secretary Allison. And in that meeting, I want you to know, Mr. Lohman, that in Cleveland, Ohio, I heard from numerous advocates and homeowners that your bank is the most difficult one to deal with when it comes to loan modifications. Over and over, I've heard the Chase has been especially slow to process paperwork. I've heard that Chase denies borrowers modifications without supplying a reason. I've heard that Chase leaves borrowers facing foreclosure in limbo. Now, of the four largest mortgage servicers, all of which are represented here today, why is the average length of trial modification for Chase mortgagers nearly seven and a half months, Mr. Lohman? As, as we've mentioned, all of us have mentioned, uh, the resource uh, needs for this program uh, have, you know, outstripped uh, our ability to have the right number of people in seats uh, performing the functions. We have... Um, so you're under, we, you, you're we, saying you don't have enough people to handle the we program? We have historically not had enough people to handle the demand for the program. Uh, we were the, one of the first out of the box when the HAMP program uh, was announced and you know we started um, accepting you know, here's an, here's an, applications. I'm, excuse me because I, I have limited time here. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the program's been going on for 19 months. That's correct. And we've, Now it, it seems to me you could... We've hired you know, thousands you, of you people demand, in those periods. I understand. It seems to me you know the demand. Your performance is, uh, is, is very weak. If you know there's a demand and you're getting incentivized anyhow from the taxpayers See, I just wonder how hard you're really trying. That, that's the concern that I have. And when right. I get reports from my own constituents that you're uh, denying modifications without supplying a reason and you're leaving borrowers facing foreclosure in limbo, uh, your explanation doesn't cut it. We, we have increased our staff. We've invested in our systems. Um, we do have, have historically had a backlog of loans that are in trial. And now we are literally looking at every loan that's in a trial beyond its original trial period, looking at it loan by loan, making sure that we don't leave any stones unturned to give folks a modification. What do I tell and, my constituents? And, what do and, I tell my constituents when they tell me Chase won't work with them? They should um, they should call the one eight hundred number. One eight hundred number that what, what number should I call the one eight number? You should call the one eight hundred number, number, number that we're number that, I can call you Absolutely. Mr. Lohman? There is. On behalf of my constituents? Yes. Okay. I'll, we'll, we'll chat afterwards. Yeah, then. absolutely. Be happy to do it. I, I want to help you do more we, and do better. We, we have a number of, that, that I can, can put on the record, 1-800-335-0123 for anybody uh, who has constituent complaints. Be happy to personally deal with them. I just, I just want to make sure, Mr. Chairman, it's not like those bumper stickers that say you like my driving, call one 800 Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we have a uh, memo that says more borrowers have been kicked out of HAMP than have received permanent modifications. Cumulatively, HAMP has now placed 346,000 borrowers in permanent mortgage modifications, but this is overshadowed by the fact that 429,000 temporary modifications and 6,300 permanent modifications have been canceled. 
But I'm now told also that the Fitch Rating Service recently came out and, and said that uh, they estimated that 75 percent of those permanent modifications will ultimately default. And, I, and then I'm also told that TARP set aside $75 billion for this program, but only 30 to 40 million has been paid out in the first uh, year and a half. At that rate, it would take 200 years, roughly, I guess, to get all this money out, which it seems to me uh, ridiculous that they've set aside that much money for what it now appears to be a, f a failed or failing uh, program. Because I just heard in response to questions from uh, uh, Chairman Jordan that uh, uh, that only about 10 to 20 percent of your loan modifications are under HAMP in the first place, and that. Uh, and we were told before the hearing, and I, my understanding is now that's been confirmed here uh, by most of you that uh, almost all of these uh, uh, modifications under HAMP, you would have tried to work at, work out uh, through your own private uh, uh, modification programs. So uh, I, I don't believe I've ever heard of a, a program that is uh, uh, doing less uh, or working. Uh, in a worse way, just about, and that's a. I, I'm wondering. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if any of you would uh, dispute what Mr. Pinto said when he he estimated that uh, Hamp will ultimately meet only six to eight percent of its original goal. And uh, and he used the words numbing com complexity. Do any do. Any of you dispute those that estimate, that uh, a very pessimistic estimate that he has presented here today, or uh, would any of you dispute his description of the uh, requirements uh, as as being numbing complexity? Congressman, uh, I'm not sure that I would use um, that phrase to describe HAMP. I believe that um, <clears throat> we all stood behind HAMP and created it together, along with you, with with the Treasury Department. We wanted to make sure that. We had one uniform program, and we really focused on scale on that program. And I think it's important for us to understand that we all collectively got behind this problem and, and focused on scale. Uh, last year, it wasn't the case. Um, more importantly, we got um, the GSEs uh, to come behind the program, and all our loss mitigators now had one program that they had to deal with as opposed to nuanced proprietary programs. So I believe that HAMP worked and worked in scale when it needed to. However, I believe there's a part B to that, which is that this problem is moving. It's moving forward. Uh, and I believe that we now need to focus on fallouts from HAMP, we need to focus on redefaults, and we really need to focus on a targeted foreclosure prevention program. So HAMP needs to evolve, no question. But I think that it served its purpose when it did. And um, uh, I want to applaud uh, my colleagues for having tried as hard as they did, uh, along with ourselves in uh, scaling uh, what, what, what was an important response to the to homeowners at the time. Uh, Any other comments? Uh, if I may, I just add one other thing, is, is before HAMP there was, uh, I, I think one of the, the significant advantages of HAMP has been the establishment of sta standards, and in particular the debt to income ratio that was used even on our proprietary programs prior to HAMP was higher than the 31 percent, and to establish that as a standard that's usual and customary so that where we have uh, the ability to work on behalf of investors we can do so has enabled the results we do have with HAMP, but equally importantly, the results that we do have in our proprietary programs as well. So that is a significant advantage. Of course, if it, if it was working the way it should, uh, uh, your companies uh, would stand to make a lot of money out of it and become government uh, contractors, at least to the extent in this, uh, for this program. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, I'll yield. Following up on that, ma'am, uh, if, uh, if if you, in fact, had the higher debt to ratio, in other words, if Treasury had effectively sent, set it at 45, 55, wouldn't you have more loans going out today? I'll ask on my own time. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for their willingness to come and help us 
But I have to ask, uh, in my state, we've seen uh, the number of foreclosures uh, double uh, this past month, uh, month of May 2010 compared to month of May 2009. It's actually gone up 120 percent. And uh, unlike when this uh, housing crisis first struck, when we saw a lot of subprime mortgages out there and, and uh, poor product and maybe people who were in homes that they couldn't afford, now we see the greatest correlation is uh, unemployment with uh, people not being able to stay in their homes. And I'm wondering if uh, this tool that we initially uh, came up with, the HAMP program, is the right tool to deal with that type of problem. Uh, because if someone's out of work and there's not the a stream of income to support a mortgage, it doesn't matter how you design it or how you you modify it, if there is no income to support that mortgage, it's going to end up in, in foreclosure. Uh, and, and so I'm fearful. I, I see how this is all working out. I see all the attempts you're making. I also see that uh, about 434,000 people who were, were kicked out of the HAMP program, the trial program, because you could not verify uh, income. And uh, so, so what I'm afraid of what's happening is here, uh, under TARP, which, which, which created the HAMP program, uh, which I voted against uh, because I did not approve of the bailout for the, for the Wall Street banks, uh, under this program, you're being paid an awful lot of money to process these uh, attempted modification, these trials. But after you do all this work, which you're being paid for by taxpayer money. I see 434,000 people kicked out of the program. So, so their foreclosures were delayed for a little bit. And it, uh, it allowed you to be paid for that attempt. But at the end of the day, the taxpayer money is spent by your firms because 50% of the second mortgage market is sitting at that table right there. Uh, 50% of the national second, second liens. Uh, so I just think this is uh, sort of insult to injury. We're spending all this money in the program. It is, it is accruing to your benefit in a significant way. The taxpayer is being hurt, and the homeowners are not being helped in a significant way. That's you know, and, and I understand. I understand the dynamic that's out there now. It's just different because we got all these people who are unemployed, and, and uh, in some cases you can't modify that because there's nothing to support it. No, no income stream. But uh, let me ask you straight up: Do you think this program should be uh, continued beyond October? We only have a few months left here. There have been there's been very few people helped by this program. Uh, but as the folks that are administering this and seeing how many people are being helped, and how much money is being spent here. Uh, do, you, do you think this program should be extended uh, come October, given the fact that we still have streams and streams of, uh, of foreclosures uh, coming down the pike? Mr. Das? Um, yes, sir. I believe that the short answer is that I believe that this program should be continued. As I have said before, this program provided a great a great baseline and, and a uniform baseline. If we didn't have all of the GSEs and all of the banks participating in this program in a uniform way, there could be a lot of consumer confusion, as we saw in the beginning of last year. I would, however, submit that this program needs to be enhanced. As you rightly pointed out, Congressman, uh, unemployment is a big issue. And um, not being able to sustain, have a sustainable income stream uh, to make the payment Mr. Will call Goss, I only have a little bit of time, and I just want to find out if you wanted the program to be continued. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Sir? Uh, if I could, just one clarification. We are only paid as a servicer at the time of the permanent modification, not during the trial uh, period. And I do believe the program should be extended to allow the new components of the program, the second lien program, the home affordable foreclosure alternative short sale program, as well as the unemployment and principal forgiveness components of it should be allowed to play out to determine if that can help more borrowers stay in their homes. Thank you. Mr. Friedman? Um, yeah, I think it would be, it should be continued now, especially in light that the program now you're verifying items up front. So I think that will actually help 
um, see much more positive results out of the program. Mr. Hyde? And I would add for the 80% uh, of the mods that are happening outside the program, there is no government payment of any kind. As far as your question on the program itself, I would continue it. I would finish the enhancements already made. I would not expand it. Okay. Mr. Lohman? Yes, it should continue. And Mr. Pinto? I would ask uh, Treasury to provide very clear information, which they promised many, many months ago, about redefault rates. They have published virtually no information about redefaults. Uh, there is a benchmark for that, and I mentioned it in my testimony, the Mortgage Metrics Report. You need to know how this program is doing compared to the way OCC has been tracking for 18 months modifications. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I begin, I think I've, we've both heard enough to know that we need to have Treasury back here well before the October uh, end to talk about lessons learned and if there is to be any modification extension be, to get to us sooner rather than later, wouldn't you agree? Well, you know, we've had Treasury in here, and I mean, so it's not something that we have not done. You know, I think there's a lot of questions that should be raised, even, you know, with the people that are involved in terms of uh, with the services. Because, you know, let's give you a classic example, and then I'm going to let you uh, gain your time. I'll take this off of my time some kind of way. Uh, that you have people that were put into mortgages, uh, I mean, by folks that are no longer probably working for the bank now. They're gone in, in somewhere. And then now they're coming in. You know, what happens to them? There's a lot of things that, you know, I think we need to spend time now talking with uh, the services and people who uh, have experienced these things. People probably got fired because they put people into mortgages that they knew uh, that they shouldn't have gone into. I think these are some questions that we need to get answered before we even deal with anybody else. On that note, I want you to know I did not take it off of your time. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for giving us this opportunity today. Uh, before I come to Miss, and it could be your correct pronunciation, I didn't hear it ever. Desor. Desor. Uh, I, I had uh, I'd previously asked you about the fact that a new level of income to debt had been established. Uh, prior to that time, well, certainly with stated income, it's often called liar loans and so on, uh, somebody could have 100% uh, income to uh, actual income to, uh, uh, to debt, but certainly many people in your experience had much higher ratios, 45, 50 percent, relying on two incomes at their highest level. Isn't that true? Uh, that's correct. There were higher incomes in the origination side right. of the, the So business. when we look at failures in backward looking, an artificially high ability to make a loan, often to flip it to government programs, Freddie and Fannie and so on, uh, but allow allowing a much higher ratio was part of the situation because if there was any hiccup in the income or if it didn't appreciate and they weren't able to pull money out, ultimately there was a problem we were, wa we were heading toward now that you have the opportunity to look back at, at what happened starting in, in the case of Mr. Kucinich's district in 2006, but in the case of other districts a little later. Isn't that right? Uh, yes, the programs are intended when there is a hardship, which means that income has right. been disrupted, to then revamp right. the mortgage payment to so be at, more affordable tied to that income. Right. So at 31 percent, is this the right number going forward? When I was a kid, it was lower. Uh, 25 percent would have been a stretch in many cases. Uh, what would you say the right number is in order to not ha to have enough cushion for normal ups and downs of income and so on and still be able to stay in your home and meet your mortgage? I believe a 31 percent ratio is appropriate, but not for everyone. And in particular, when you look at a low-income household, 31 percent is probably still high. So we have been recommending to Treasury that they consider lowering that for certain categories of borrowers. And on a proprietary basis, we're looking at the same thing. Okay. Well, I think that's uh, certainly good judgment. It's something that I don't think is partisan here. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask one question to all of you. If 